I was thinking about this, and it was 11 years ago I took uh, an EMT basic class. And one of the things that they teach you in emergency medicine is don't get distracted by the visibly gross injuries. Let me give you an example here. So if, if, if someone was in an accident and they broke their lower leg, right? They broke the tibia and the fibula, which can get kind of nasty. And you show up on scene and you know how your leg is supposed to be straight. Let's say somehow the bone's broke and it's kind of turned around like that and the foot's facing the person's head. It's, kinda, it's pretty gross, right? We don't need to think too much about that, but just think about that. It's a really gnarly injury, right? It's a re really, really distracting injury for that rescuer that's showing up, for that paramedic, that EMT, that EMR, that's coming to help that person that's been hurt. Now, if that responder focuses on that gross leg injury, they might miss the, the broken ribs that pierced that person's lung. They might miss the bleeding in the abdomen from the liver that was lacerated in this accident. They might forget to check for those less visible or invisible or internal injuries because they're so worried about that really gross-looking leg, right? That broken leg, though it's the most visible, is that going to kill someone? Not right away. It's not going to kill someone. But the internal bleeding in the abdomen from the liver or the punctured lung from the broken rib, that can kill someone. So when that paramedic or that EMT gets on scene, they're going to check the whole person over. At least that's what they should be doing. It's like, okay, I see the leg. That's kind of a gross injury, but let's, let's check everything else out here. It's so, okay, I'm going to check the head. Okay, there's nothing, nothing that seems broken. There's no bleeding. That seems okay. I'm going to check the chest. Ooh, those ribs are a little, they're a little crunchy. That's not, that's not a good thing. Let's keep an eye on that. I'm going to have to work, work on that. Look at the abdomen. Oh, that doesn't, that doesn't feel real. That doesn't feel quite right. It's a little distended. There's something wrong here. Now that leg is bad, but that's not going to kill him. The, the crunchy chest and the, the distended abdomen, those are, those are the priorities because those can kill this person. What a weird way to start a sermon, right? But we need to take a similar approach when we read Scripture. Here in Luke, when we read, you must hate your father and mother, hate your wife and children, hate your brothers and sisters, hate your own life. We are tempted to get stuck on that hate idea and miss the greater message that Jesus has for us. It's like focusing on that badly broken leg and missing the problems, missing the injuries that can kill a person. It's easy to get distracted by what we perceive to be something we think is an unscriptural statement within Scripture. And we fail to recognize the main point that Jesus is trying to make for us, the warning that Jesus has for us. Today we continue in our Tough Stuff series. Luke 14, 26 reads this. Again, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. The first question we need to ask is, does Jesus truly mean we are to hate with a burning passion we are to dislike, detest, abhor, despise, loathe our father, loathe our mother, hate our wife, detest our children, hate our brother, our sister, hate ourselves? Is, there, is it a requirement for us to be filled with hatred toward those we should love in order to be a disciple of Jesus? What is the greatest commandment? Tell me, what is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord, yes. It's a very quick paraphrase that I came up with. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Make it even simpler. Love God, love people, right? That is the greatest commandment. And this is not something that Jesus just made up. It wasn't new to the people of Jesus' time. It comes from the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And we combine this with Leviticus 19. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. In Matthew's gospel, during the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells us this. 
You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Who said that? Is that biblical? Anybody know if that was biblical? It wasn't. It was an idea that was going around at the time, but it wasn't a biblical concept. You have heard it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Jesus says it another way in Luke. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Jesus would go on to clarify who is my neighbor in the parable of the Good Samaritan, telling us that anyone we encounter is our neighbor. Love your neighbor applies to absolutely everybody. We cannot sit there and say, well, they're not a Christian, so I don't have to love them. No. Well, they're not an American, so I don't have to love them. No. That person is old. They have nothing left to offer. I, I don't have to love them. No. That person is just a teenager. They don't know how the world works yet, so I don't have to love them. No. So why would Jesus say that being a disciple consists of loving our enemies, but hating our parents, hating our spouse, hating our children, hating our siblings, hating ourselves? Well, depending on the context in which the word hate is used, it can have different meanings. Sometimes in the Bible, hate means hate as we understand it, that intense dislike or aversion to someone or something. So when Jesus says to his followers, when he says to us, the world will hate you because of me, that is our typical understanding of hate. You will be hated by the world. You will be hated by people of the world simply because you identify as a follower of Jesus Christ. Remember, also in reading Scripture, part of understanding the context of what we read is knowing that the message is being given to a first century audience. It is a timeless message with, with meaning to us today, but originally this was given to a first century audience. If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. The people hearing this nearly 2,000 years ago understood the figure of speech that Jesus was giving. He didn't mean to literally hate those that you are supposed to love. It means to love them less than what it's being compared to. Love them less then you love Jesus. Perhaps a better way for us in the 21st century to understand what Jesus is saying here is to paraphrase it like this. Jesus said, If anyone comes to me and loves their father and mother more than they love me, loves wife and children more than they love me, loves brothers and sisters more than they love me, yes, loves their own life more than they love me, such a person cannot be my disciple. Love for Christ must be primary if you are going to be a Christ follower. And if you are going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, it is going to cost you something. That is what this section is about. It is not about hating parents or spouse or children or siblings or self. If we get distracted by that one verse, we miss the point Jesus is making. You must, if you don't hate your father and mother, you can't be my disciple. Well, I don't like that part. That doesn't, that doesn't make sense to me. So I'm going to throw the whole section out. We can't do that. We need to understand what Jesus is saying. And we need to understand it by looking at the entire section. In verse 25 of Luke 14, large crowds were traveling with Jesus. Large crowds. So he's not speaking just to the 12 that are closest to him. He's not speaking to the extended group of disciples, people that are already committed followers of Jesus or have at least really gathered around him closely. They might not be part of that inner circle, but there's more than just 12 followers of Jesus at this point. This large crowd would encompass both the believers, the disciples, 
and people that are just hearing about Jesus or people that are, are kind of trying to figure out what this Jesus guy is saying. Think of it as a good old-fashioned Billy Graham rally without the choir and without the King James. It's pretty much what's going on. Because everybody knows the King James wasn't written until Paul wrote it a couple decades later. That was my joke. I guess it wasn't funny, so it wasn't a joke. So if Jesus were saying these things to his disciples... If Jesus were saying these things to his disciples, it would only apply to them, right? But he's saying it to believers and non-believers alike. Jesus wants people to know before they commit to following him what being a Christ follower is going to be like. What Jesus is about to say in this section, if you don't hate your father and mother, you can't be my disciple, what he's about to say in this section applies to anyone that is about to say yes to God. So what does Jesus say? We've already looked at verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. He's saying that we must love Jesus above everything else in life. I've also heard it put this way. This is how David Platt put it. Your love for Jesus should be so great that it makes the love you have for family look like hate. Your love for Jesus should be so great that it makes the love you have for family look like hate. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. We've turned this idea of carrying our cross today into a burden that we carry with us, a difficult situation that we encounter in life. Let's go back to my earlier example of the the accident victim. Let's say they recovered from everything else. They're, They're doing well, everything's going great, except for that leg, that broken leg that we weren't as worried about. Well, now it turned out to be something kind of bad, and they unfortunately had to have that leg amputated. It's a devastating injury this person is going to need to adjust to in their life. But then we're tempted to say, now that, my friend, now that is your cross to bear, living with that prosthetic leg. And I'm not trying to minimize that kind of injury. I I can't imagine enduring something like that. It's going to be a major life adjustment. But that's not what Jesus means here by requiring us to carry our cross if we wish to be his disciple. Again, remember, who are we talking to? Who is the audience It's a first century audience. A first century audience living in Palestine under Roman rule. So what did the cross mean to them? It meant torture, condemnation, conviction, criminal conviction. It meant death to them. The only reason one would be carrying their cross is if they are on their way to die. I mentioned David Platt just a moment ago, and Ron mentioned him um, in our class, that, uh, mentioned the class that we took. Uh, Platt modernizes this comparison by saying it would be if, if Jesus said, take up your electric chair and follow me. It's an instrument of execution. Take up your electric chair daily and follow me. It isn't about having a bad day or a bad month or a bad decade. You might have a bad day, You get up, you miss your bus, you spill your coffee, you're late for work, boss gets angry, this was your last chance, you lose your job. Those are bad things. It's going to make for a really bad day. But that's not what it means to carry your cross. Jesus uses this image elsewhere, also in Luke. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. If carrying your cross daily isn't about having a bad day or going through difficult times, then what is it really about? Well, Paul gives us a wonderful explanation here in Galatians. Paul says this, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God 
who loved me and gave himself for me. It means that every day we live, when we live for Jesus, we must remind ourselves that our life does not belong to us. We have died. We have died to self. Mike Lehman died. Mike Lehman no longer lives. At least that's the way it should be. It is Christ who lives in me. In everything, in everything, what we must do is what God wants us to do, what God is calling us to do. And we need to remember to do that every day. Remember last week, we talk, or last couple weeks, we talked about the lost sheep, the lost coin. They find the sheep, they bring it back. They find the coin, they put it back. But when it comes to a human being, that's a little more difficult because humans have emotions, humans have thought, humans have free will. So for us, it's not simply a one-time thing. For humans, we have to remind ourselves every single day to pick up our cross, which is exactly what Jesus says. Must deny themselves and take up their cross, say it with me, daily and follow me. Now, Jesus' death on the cross was a one-time atonement for our sins. He doesn't have to keep being re-crucified and re-crucified and re-crucified for us to be saved. He's not a, routine, a, a, a repeated sacrifice. But we need to remind ourselves every single day that we need to live for Jesus. We must take up our cross daily. To be a disciple of Jesus, one must carry their cross. And in carrying their cross, one must understand that they are dead, that they no longer live, but it is Christ who lives in them. To be a disciple of Jesus, one must love him more than they love anything or anyone else. Jesus must be more important to us than our spouse. Jesus must be more important to us than our kids. Jesus must be more important to us than our house or our car or our motorcycle. Jesus must be more important to us than our football team or our family heirlooms, and Jesus must be more important to us than our country. But this isn't the message that modern churches give. I have a book called Stories with Intent. It's about the parables of Jesus. It's got a lot of information in there. I really like it. A lot of the sermons I've been giving have a lot of that's come from those, that book, which is a wonderful book. But in speaking about the two parables that are included in this section, building a tower and a king going to war, the author Klein Snodgrass offers this insight that I want you to hear. These parables differ greatly from the easy believism that marks so much of American Christianity. Churches urge everyone to believe, to accept Jesus, but make no demands on people's lives. The more adherents, the better even if the message is curtailed for marketing purposes. Such shallow ideas about conversion create enormous problems for individuals, churches, and societies. We need to do a much better job helping people understand what Christianity really is about. The concern is not going to heaven, as important as heaven is, but living now in accordance with Jesus' own life. Snodgrass here calls it easy believism. Dietrich Bonhoeffer would call it cheap grace. Either way, it's not the truth of the gospel. Yes, God seeks us. God reaches out to us. God offers his hand to us. We learned that in our parables the last couple of weeks about the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the merciful father and his two lost sons. God brought us grace in the form of his son, Jesus Christ. But we need to better understand what it means to say yes to God. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. 
when he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. These two parables seem quite similar in the message that they convey. Before you take action, know what will or know at least what is likely to happen if you pursue that course. If you wish to build a tower for fortification or for a pretty view or whatever your reason is for building a tower, be sure you have the ability to complete it before you start building. This is an action that you begin. If an army comes against you that is far more powerful than your army, instead of being foolish and going into battle, seek a peaceful resolution that's agreeable to both sides. Is this God coming after you? Will you resist God? Is that going to be successful if you resist God? Or will you surrender to him? The peaceful terms that we have with God is surrendering to Jesus. And it's not being conquered. It's not being routed. It's a wonderful peaceful resolution between us and God. If you say yes to God when he calls out to you, when he comes after you, know, that you're, know what your life will be like when you commit yourself to Jesus. And what must we do when we commit to Jesus? What must happen for one of us to become a disciple? In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Remember, Jesus is saying this to a large crowd. This is the basics of discipleship. This isn't the advanced discipleship course. This isn't graduate level work here. This is for everyone to consider before they say yes to Jesus. Jesus cannot simply be an add-on to your life, which is what we tend to make him. Just say yes to Jesus. Do him a favor and start following him. No. Jesus must be your entire life. I want you to think about that this week. I want you to think about that this week. Believers, did you count the cost of following Jesus before you said yes? Did you really count the cost of Jesus, the cost of following Jesus, before you said yes? If not, do it now. Do it this week. Reevaluate that. For any non believer that hears this message, do you know what it will cost if you follow Jesus? And to everyone, I ask this question What are you willing to give up so that you can follow Jesus? Jesus. The great danger is if there is something you aren't willing to give up, you aren't willing to give up to follow Jesus, you're not ready to be a disciple. Discipleship is hard. Discipleship costs us something. At least it should cost us something. I lost a job because of my faith in Christ. I can't prove it. If I could prove it, I probably would have sued, but I couldn't prove it. But I believe I lost a job because of my faith in Christ. It cost me something. It should cost us all something. Discipleship is hard, but discipleship is worth it. It is worth it here in this life, knowing that we serve our risen Savior, and it will be worth it in the next life when we are with Jesus in heaven.